Good morning. And he did this over and 
over and over again, making multiples, right? This is quite innovative, if you think about it. A piece of stone, limestone, with grease drawn on it, and then ink applied to it, and then with pressure removed and released to create an image. Wow, pretty crazy, right? Who would have thought? Well, that's how this print that you all recognized was created. Maybe we could call him H.P. Escher, because he's a printer. <laughs> right? So here is my dot. Here is my starting point um, for the lecture. Okay? It's my starting point to connect to what I teach as a professor, which is called printmaking, and how it and the lessons I teach and use in my own art practices as a means of illustrating how the creative process, and I've taught you guys about the creative process that I go through and teach my students in the classroom, based on the understanding of specific guiding principles of an art and design that have led creators from history and contemporaries to innovate beyond the printing press and make some sense of our world around us. My academic approach, I hope, um, does not place too many heads on the table this morning, <clears throat> but I often like to share these art secrets with you. And hopefully in your own practices, your professional practices, you can implement them too to become more innovative when you feel the need to be so. How the creative process works through the foundation of design principles that ultimately achieve innovation in fine arts. All right, so moving forward. Is that right? Is it the top button? Uh, never mind, I can do it this. Oh. Innovative. <laughs> okay? All right, so, question. Probably, probably not the best question to ask you guys. Um, who in here this morning read a newspaper? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, yeah. All right, anyways, okay. <laughs> who in here, can we fix it? Can we fix it while I'm talking? All right, who in here this morning read a newspaper? Okay, who in here spent cash money? Yeah, some of y'all. Okay, some people. Um, who's ever read a newspaper? Hey! hey! Who's ever spent cash money? Hey! Who's ever turned on the defogger on their car? Hey! Who's ever worn a t-shirt? Hey! Who's ever read street signs? Yeah. Who's ever held a microchip in their hand? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Who, when you were born, your mama made you put your feet and ink your feet and put it on a piece of paper? For your first time, yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Guess what? Those things are the prints. You can thank the printmaker. Hey, who in here can read? <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Excellent. All right, you're welcome. And the reason why I say that is the most innovative thing in our world. Back in, I guess it was 2099, AME came up with the top 100 inventions in the world that changed the world, guess what number one was? The printing press. Not the atomic bomb, bless them. They tried. But it was the printing press. Immovable type, right? And we know this because we can read. If Gutenberg hadn't created this and other artists and printmakers hadn't come together to have movable type, we would be ruling, we would not be able to read um, we would not be literate, a literate society. So there you go, right there. Thank you, you're welcome. And that's why I tell my students all the time why it's important to take printmaking. Not only keep my numbers up and keep my job, but you know, y'all like this. So anyway, this is um, the single innovation that has influenced what we do in the 21st century, but not so much the fact that we're literate. Okay? Here's the thing uppercase, lowercase letters. You see that? It comes from a printing case. So when you set type, the larger letters in the upper part of the type case and the lower, is it? Ah, 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 ah. You're welcome. <laughs> there you go. There's a little bit of trivia. Jeopardy. Yay. All right. So talk about innovation, influence and innovation. Here we are. Who is this? We know this person, right? Benjamin Franklin, printmaker, uh-huh, yes, politician, yes, statesman, check, and one of the most, uh, most famous and influential Americans is one of our founding fathers, check. 
also self-proclaimed ladies' man. But that is a tangent that I do not want to face this morning, but we'll do it later if you want to talk. Um, but in 1729, Ben Franklin bought a newspaper at the Pennsylvania Gazette. And when he did this, he also created a cartoon. And this is a famous cartoon. This is a woodblock print. Now, the innovation here is that woodblock prints have been made for centuries in China. It's actually not a new innovation. But the innovation here is the way that he created the woodblock and presented it in a newspaper to rally our troops for the revolution. Yes, y'all have seen this, join or die. Okay, this is a print. As a matter of fact, in Philadelphia, his print shop still exists. You can go to his print shop and they will print you off the same woodblock of print. Okay? Also, too, he printed money. This is early money. This was printed in his print shop. Now, the connecting points that I'm trying to create here is that we have Ben Franklin, right? He's done a lot of stuff, right? But why would someone want to do all this stuff? Well, what I find is that printmaking is a very simple yet complicated area of study. And from that, because of that complications, it makes you and promotes the creative process, the creative thinking that we have to go through. So here we have the money that he's done, and of course, here we have him here, right, on the actual money. Let me move through my notes quickly. It's like one of the Pecha Kucha thing here. I've got 60 slides. Get ready. All right, so he's one of the few <laughs> non-presidents um, on money. So that's how influential he has. Are y'all following along with me? I'm kind of skipping him. I'm improvising a little. Is that okay? I can dance too. All right, just kidding. Now, not only do, is he just a printmaker and leading that to that, but he also had other inventions, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> bifocals, yes, he created those. Because he couldn't read the type. <laughs> Again, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Progressives, good break. He also printed the Poor Richard's Almanac, which you know, influences all this daylight savings time, so on and so forth. He also made a stove that warmed houses that a lot of people used today called the Franklin stove. He also made swimming fins. Now, I don't you know how that came from printmaking. I don't know. I can probably imagine, but I'm sure something probably straightened me. Um, he also organized a unionized fire company. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's actually about fire prevention. And he founded the library company, the Philosophical Society, and the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, right? And also, of course, his groundbreaking research in electricity. All of these things lead back to printing. And printing is a form of art, okay? Now, how is this woman going to link this big old airplane to printmaking, right? <laughs> Get ready, okay? Airplane. Who is the first to really have an, a manned flight? Guess what they were? Yep, they were also printmakers. In 1889, the brothers started their own newspaper, The West Side News. Wilbur edited the paper, and Orville was the publisher. Orville was more interested in hobbies, such as his bicycles and creating the printing presses. But um, anyway, he dropped out of high school and he opened a print shop. Um, and having worked in a print shop and been apprenticed in a print shop, he designed his own printing presses, being influenced by the way bicycles work, the flapping of the wheels and the movement of the gears. All right, and eventually, um, this led to his progress in creating the very first airplane, or well, the flight, rather, excuse me, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So here we go. Innovation. Innovation. Here's a picture of that there too, right? Practical fixed wing aircraft. If you actually look at the aircraft and you look at all the gears and things, especially over here to the right, this is actually found a lot on um, letter presses called Chandler and Prices from 1887 to 1890. Um, it's the same working mechanism on a letter press. <laughs> Ziggy plays guitar. <laughs> yes. David Bowie is a printmaker. He actually has a degree in printmaking. Okay, that's how he started.
started out music and printmaking. He types that, sets types, so on and so forth. But we know David Bowie because of his music career, but it was because of his background in the arts and with the creative thinking and designing process that he is able to now not only be a singer and a songwriter, but he's also a record producer. He's an actor. Remember Laura? <laughs> right? Oh, creepy. Um, and he's also an artist. As a matter of fact, you can purchase his artwork on his website. Um, it's available for purchase at BowieArt.com, and you can see his prints. Now, this one's going to be very familiar to y'all. What is this? Do you know this? Is this yes, it is. Does it look familiar? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Do you know how it's? Yeah? Okay, again, you're welcome. Do you know why I say that? It's printed. Absolutely. And the, um, there are, like, I think there are coming three methods that are uh, typically used. Silk screening is one. Um, the other is called photo engraving. Okay. So silk screen, like your t-shirt, and I'm going to show you what it looks like, like your t-shirts that you wear, right? Like when you turn on your defog on your windscreen, that's silk screen on there, okay? Yeah, and so they silk screen the patterns on there. Photo engraving is exactly how they make money, okay? It's the same process. Etching, like I'm making my art, and you can go to my website if you want to see my etchings, they're kind of creepy. Um, and also with silicon chips, they use photolithography, like Escher did. Uh, what? So hang on, so now MC Escher is now, no, he's really not, I mean, he's H.P. Escher now for real, right? He is linked to a microchip. Are y'all understanding? This is really important, because if it hadn't been for printmaking, we wouldn't be able to get chips so small. Okay, so there is a link to innovation and technology. All right, but you have to think about it. All right, this is how the silk screen process works. You push ink through a stencil. Simple, right? Not so simple. <laughs> but still, thinking about simple ways to make phenomenal, innovative things happen. Relax. <laughs> This is also a silk screen. This is Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was very innovative because silk screen was a commercial based printing process. Okay, used for industry. Warhol used it to make really big prints of famous people that were sold like merchandise, like Marilyn and Elizabeth Taylor. So you use a commercial process to push the idea that these people were ready to be sold to market. That's the point. Innovative. Breaking boundaries. This is a photo engraving. This is actually how they make the money. <laughs> There's old Ben. All right, so we're moving forward. So great, yay, we're linking it all together, but how do we do it? How does this affect you um, in your daily life? Now listen. The creative process does not always apply to making art and making work. It can be applied to daily life. It's problem solving, but it's creative problem solving, okay? It's taking resources um, that you have at your disposal and making do with them. And that's what artists do, okay? As an educator in the arts, and I work for a very wealthy college, <laughs> When I was hired, I was a professor at Ole Miss. Y'all know Hottie Toddy? Anybody from the Hottie Toddy? No. Okay, that's all right. Y'all know this point. All right, I was a professor at Ole Miss, and then I got the job in Houston. When I showed up at Houston, they were like, oh, you have $700 to buy supplies to teach 90 students printmaking at the college level. What? $700 doesn't even cover half of the project I would do for a gallery exhibition, y'all. Seriously. So, what do you got to do? You got to be creative. You got to be thoughtful. You have to go through this process. All right. So, having a talent, this is very important, having a talent or expertise in something isn't worth much unless you know what to do with it. Right? Standing around and resting on your laurels doesn't mean anything. 
It's about doing, okay? So, the design process is one means to the creative problem solving using the elements and principles of design that I'm going to discuss this morning. All right, so the design process, I'm going to read this because if I don't, I'm going to go off on tangents and we don't want that, okay? We're just going to stick to the point. So, excuse me for reading. Um, the design process involves seeking visual solutions to problems, okay? Not math, but visual solutions, all right? You may have heard someone say, there are no rules to art. <laughs> eh, well, okay, whatever. Um, hard and fast rules, no. Um, but there are some guidelines, okay, that aren't so hard and fast. Guidelines that can be reinterpreted, all right, and used in so many different ways that ultimately innovative ideas can be communicated. It's like music. In music, you have set amounts of notes, right? And the combination of the notes make the music different, correct? Well, the elements and principles of design are what we as artists have, like music notes to create new visual images and ways to communicate, all right? The arts are called creative fields because there are no predetermined correct answers. Remember that. There are no predetermined correct answers in anything, unless you play football, because there are rules to football, right? Tennis, basketball. When you go visit my mama at her house, <laughs> there are rules. But in the world today, especially with the expansion of technologies and everything, there are no rules, right? There are none. So you have to be flexible, all right, so to speak, um, because there are no predetermined correct answers. Just We just know that some of the answers are better than others, right? Like, why did you post that picture on the Facebook? I don't know. Right? Um, we as humans are pretty interesting in that we like certain things with discerning visual information. We like things to make sense, things that are easy to see, easy to read, easy to see, right? Um, and things that stick with us once we move on to another bit of visual information. The guidelines, meaning the elements and principles, help to make visual solutions successful. However, the no rules phrase does not mean that all devices are equally valid and visually successful. A lot of times you can see that when you're walking down streets and looking in windows and looking at architecture and you go, wow, really? Um, but good design and bad design may follow the same guidelines, but it's the way the designer or artist utilizes the elements and principles, and that's the main difference, all right? It has been said that experts don't usually innovate because they stick to the rules of the game they understand. Artists and designers, on the other hand, manipulate their expertise using guidelines, elements and principles of art. Okay? So, I'm going to share these secrets with you. This is what I teach my students. This is a creative process. It's very simple, just like the silk screen, pushing ink through a stencil. It's very simple. However, it's with practice that you get better at the process. And by looking for different solutions and play is what makes you really this process successful. Getting started, here we go. It, the first of the creative process is thinking. Yes, obviously, right? You gotta think about something, okay? The second is looking. A lot of times we don't look. We overthink. We think too much. The thing is you have to think and then you have to look. And sometimes you go back and you think again. So the third step is the doing. However, a lot of times you do first, then you think about it, and then you look at it, and then you go back and you do it again. So I put them in this, I didn't put a one, two, three on them because they're not sequential. Again, Guidelines, not rules, right? You have to think first, you have to do, no, 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 no. It goes back and forth, all right? This happens to be one of my favorite paintings. I love it, so great. Oh, guess what slide this is? The thinking. This is a thinker by Rodin. This is a sculpture. All right, so when we're thinking about the problem, what we ask ourselves a lot of times as artists and designers is what exactly are we trying to achieve, right? What specific visual or intellectual effect is desired by our client or by ourselves? It just kind of 
have dependents, right? Um, are there any stylistic requirements? These are things you probably think about as programmers or in your daily life. Like, for instance, when you're making bread, right? When you're making cookies. I mean, this is not just for work. This is for everything on an outfit, right? Stylistic requirements. Can I wear a bikini in the lecture bikini? No. <laughs> right? Stylistic requirements, right? Um, and what are the physical limitations of this as well? So things you're thinking about the problem with that. With the looking, here's a painting um, by Monet. Um, you, you want to look around you, be inspired. The looking is the inspiration. Nature, here we see an inspiration of nature, the way the sun reflects off the haystacks there in France. History, events, other artworks, so on and so forth. Culture, all right? The thing is, is that you want to find a source, okay? You want to find a source for your looking, and then from that source, you want to create a subject. So here the Monet painting, the source is the landscape, the environment that alters and changes. This is a haystack in wintertime. He has other ones from different times of the year, but his subject is the haystacks, right? So this is what he's doing. We can look at history and culture. The thing is, is that we have to visually train and retrain ourselves about all of this. Um, and it's about the way of looking at things, all right? And that comes with practice and also to um, opening yourself up to the ability uh, to look and think and see things differently. The last one to me is the most important one. And that is the doing. Do y'all recognize who this is? It is. This is Pablo Picasso in his studio. When Picasso died at age 91 in April of 1973, I just missed him. He had become one of the most famous and successful artists throughout history. He is undeniably the most prolific genius in the history of art. I personally, there's some of his art I don't care for, but this is why I respect the man. His career spanned over 78 years in which he created 13,500 paintings, 100,000 prints and engravings, and 34,000 illustrations. That's a lot of doing, <laughs> right? That's a lot of bad art, and that's a lot of good art. But the thing is, is you got to make the... Oh, I'm doing it. It's not teacher voice, okay? Not even the microphone there isn't helping. Because I just yelled in the name. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the thing is, is that you have to make bad art in order to do what? Make the good art. you got to do bad things in practice, in trial and error, right? Trial and error, over and over again. All right? So you have to, this doing part is experimentation. Linking dots that don't seem to connect. Using in your life. A lot of times when I'm trying to explain art processes to students and they look at me like scared bunnies, I say, no, no, no. It's like when you make gravy. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, no, no, no. See, what you do, the ink is too thin. So when, what happens when the gravy is too thin? And they go, oh, I like flour. And I'm like, exactly. So this is magnesium carbonate. Add it like flour. Oh, they mix it up. They're like, oh, it's thick again. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Don't explain the science. Just explain it the way they understand, right? But it is. It's food, right? There you go. All right. So trial and error. Intuition. This is something we forget about all the time. Kismet things. Intuition. Okay. That's really important. And I think a lot of times that's what kind of separates our desires. We follow our intuition. Okay. You can apply the system. However, if it doesn't work, redo it and don't do it the same way. Because guess what? If you do it the same way over and over and over again, what's going to happen? Same thing's going to happen and you're going to start smoking cigarettes again. <laughs> okay? So what's going to happen? So here's an example, a fine example, okay? Raymond uh, Lowy is one of the famous designers we have here in the United States. He was given the job to create the, the Greyhound bus logo. <coughs> so he, he, he 
thought about it, and he, he did, he thought, and he researched, and he did, and he studied greyhounds, and he drew them, and he came with a very simple image, and he took it to them, and they said, um, why do you think that is? Yeah, that's what, that's what greyhounds look like. I mean, that's, you know, that's rendering it realistically. But the thing is that greyhounds, if we have that on the greyhound, greyhound, I mean, they're slow already, sorry. <laughs> but it would imply that they're even slower than they're supposed to be. But when Logie thinned him out, and stretched him out slightly and made him thinner, it made him sleek like the designs of the buses, okay? So this is doing and redoing until your customer is and you get the money in your pocket. All right, so here we go. About the creative process. Two things are very important, content and form, ladies and gentlemen. Content and form. Content is the subject matter and the story and the form is how it's made, all right? Because a picture is worth a thousand words. And sometimes it's funny, right? To the left, this is the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. We all know that. And to the right, it's the Mona Lisa, but it's a postcard that's been drawn on, and that's funny. But why is it funny? Well, because seriously, it's funny. <laughs> you know. But if you see underneath it, it's L H O O Q. <laughs> Where is the Mona Lisa? In the Palace Right? No, that was not Scottish. Sorry, that was too That's pretty Scottish, though. I love Scottish. Anyway, the pictures are a great way to communicate. It can be a starting point to innovation. And here we can see an artist's innovative way of expressing how he feels about the nature of art post World War I. And as a reaction to the carnage of that terrible war, he, his name is Marcel Duchamp, himself fought in the trenches, getting his toes nibbled by the rats. All right? He and the artists from a movement known as Dadaism, you ever heard of that? Okay, another Jeopardy question. Dada means hobby horse. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, they did this and picked it out, right? Random, random, intuitive, random. All right? And they felt that, the, that any civil civilization that could tolerate such brutality um, had no right to have beautiful things, right? Um, it needed to clear itself of, it, of its institutions, including traditional art along with it. So here we are, his response to that is, you killed off generations of people, civilization, you don't get anything nice anymore, shame on you, okay? And we laugh at that because you can't do that, right? Um, however, protest art is a very real thing, and it's been happening sometimes with humor, of course, you know, um, and sometimes a little bit more with humor, but a little bit uh, more satire, so to speak. This is a photograph of a stencil artwork by a London-based artist named Banksy. No one knows who he, she is. Yeah, it's whatever, I don't know. Um, but anyway, this was actually painted and uh, put on the side of the Parliament building. Um, and here you can see this protest um, there too. So just in the same vein as Duchamp. Moving along, finding design. So a lot of times when we hear the word design, five minutes, Okay, when we hear the word design, we think about many different things here. All right, so DIY projects, the design network, so on and so forth. Um, but really design is more of being organized, organizing all the elements and principles of art into a way that we understand it, okay? So, these are the elements, very simple, straightforward. We have line, shape, texture, value, color. All the images in the background enjoy, they're very beautiful. They're all famous artists and things like that. If you are curious who they are, I'll tell you later. But most of them, um, they're all rock and roll. All right, so the first element, line. Guess who? Coke. Right. Uh, is it Coke? No, it's a white line on a red background. <laughs> Uh-huh. So Nike, J 
just do it. That's right. Well, it's a black line um, that has different shapes and forms, right? And it's called Nike. Who is this? This is the Nike of Sontres. Ah, that's inspiration. Here we go. Another dot, 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 dot. Straight back. Winged victory is what it means. Also, mine is really fun because it's implied. He's getting his pocket picked, y'all. Can you see? Look at the eyes. She's distracting him, and there you go. Line is very important. Rhythm. This is Everett Weston. This is Dr. Kirk Choke. 
Um, and then we have focal point. This is actually a real ad. And then space. This is the Kellinger Museum in Glasgow, Scotland. And then motion. Early photography. And then implied movement here. So, for you, um, and thank you for listening to me, I'm going to hurry up and finish up. But anyway, so, uh, the unexpected is what pushes us to innovate, all right? Um, and it is uh, the variables within these guiding elements and principles that leads our world on a fantastic journey from that very first God. And I end with this because I want you to think a little bit differently. This is my challenge to my students that I get to them and challenge to you is I want you to be able to discern between reading the color and reading the color name to know the difference. And be able to quickly look at that and be able to discern the difference. And that's a challenge. There's a lot of times we don't take the time to discern the two. So when you look at this, initially, you want to say blue, yellow, red, green, because you're looking, you're reading. The illiterate man and the literate man see the world very differently. So when we as artists, we are both illiterate and literate, we try to look at the world in both ways. So an illiterate man would see red, green, blue, yellow. So it's trying to see both worlds, different worlds, and connect the dots between the two. That's the creative process. Thanks.